everyone, I'm Jennifer Donnelly and I just want to say a huge heartfelt thank you for naming my book Stepsister to the Kentucky Bluegrass Award reading list. It's a huge honor for me. Stepsister um, takes up where Cinderella leaves off and follows the story of her two ugly stepsisters. Ever since I was little, I was fascinated by these two characters and I wanted to know what happened to them after the Cinderella story ended. Were they sorry for their terrible behavior? Did they even try to change? And what had made them so mean in the first place? I based my story on a version of Cinderella by the Brothers Grimm. Now in the Grimm's version, the stepsisters actually cut off pieces of their feet in order to fit into that glass slipper. And that image has always haunted me. I think it's a real powerful metaphor for the way we cut off pieces of ourselves to fit in, to conform to other people's ideas of what we should be, how we should behave. I wrote Stepsister to push back on that a little, to challenge readers to start defining beauty for themselves and most importantly, to find beauty in themselves. I'd like to read you a little of the book now. I'll start with the epigraph. I think I'll skip the prologue and get right on to the first chapter. So you can meet Isabel, the main character. Okay, here we go. This is a dark tale, a grim tale. It's a tale from another time. A time when wolves waited for girls in the forest. Beasts paced the halls of cursed castles and witches lurked in gingerbread houses with sugar-kissed roofs. That time is long gone. But the wolves are still here and twice as clever. The beasts remain and death still hides in a dusting of white. It's grim for any girl who loses her way, grimmer still for a girl who loses herself. Know that it's dangerous to stray from the path, but it's far more dangerous not to. Chapter one. In the kitchen of a grand mansion, a girl sat clutching a knife. Her name was Isabel. She was not pretty. She held the knife's blade over the flames of a fire burning in the hearth. Behind her, sprawled half unconscious in another chair, was her sister Octavia. Octavia's face was deathly pale. Her eyes were closed. The once white stocking covering her right foot was crimson with blood. Adele, the sister's old nursemaid, peeled it off and gasped. Octavia's heel was gone. Blood dripped from the ugly wound where it used to be and pooled on the floor. Though she tried to hold it in, a moan of pain escaped her. Hush, Tavi, Maman scolded. The prince will hear you. Just because your chances are ruined doesn't mean your sisters must be. Maman was the girl's mother. She was standing by the sink, rinsing blood out of a glass slipper. The prince had come searching for the one who'd worn it. He danced all night with a beautiful girl at a masquerade ball three days ago and had fallen in love with her. But at the stroke of midnight, the girl had run away, leaving only a glass slipper behind. He would marry the girl who'd worn it. He vowed her and no other. Mama was determined that one of her daughters would be that girl. She'd greeted the royal party in the foyer and requested that Isabel and Octavia be allowed to try the slipper on in privacy, in deference to their maidenly modesty. The prince had agreed, the Grand Duke had held out a velvet pillow, Mama had carefully lifted the slipper off it and carried it into the kitchen. Her daughters had followed her. We should have heated the blade for Tavi, Mama fretted now. Why didn't I think of it? Heat sears the vessels, it stops the bleeding. Ah well. It will go better for you, Isabel. Isabel swallowed. But Mama, how will I walk? She asked in a small voice. Silly girl, you will ride in a golden carriage. Servants will lift you in and out. Flames licked the silver blade. It grew red. Isabel's eyes grew large with fear. She thought of a stallion lost to her now that she had once loved. But Mama. How will I gallop through the forest? The time has come to put such childish pursuits aside, Mama said, drying the slipper. 
I've bankrupted myself trying to attract suitors for you and your sister. Pretty gowns and fine jewels cost a fortune. A girl's only hope in life is to make a good marriage, and there's no finer match than the Prince of France. I can't do it, Isabel whispered. I can't. Mama put the glass slipper down. She walked to the hearth and took Isabel's face in her hands. Listen to me, child, and listen well. Love is pain, love is sacrifice. The sooner you learn that, the better. Isabel squeezed her eyes shut. She shook her head. Mama released her. She was silent for a bit. When she finally spoke again, her voice was cold, but her words were scalding. You are ugly, Isabel. Dull, lumpy as a dumpling. I could not even convince the schoolmaster's knock-kneed clod of a son to marry you. Now a prince waits on the other side of the door, a prince, Isabel, and all you have to do to make him yours is cut off a few toes, just a few useless little toes. Mama wielded shame like an assassin wields a dagger, driving it straight into her victim's heart. She would win, she always won, Isabel knew that. How many times had she cut away parts of herself at her mother's demand, the part that laughed too loudly, that rode too fast and jumped too high, the part that wished for a second helping, more gravy, a bigger slice of cake. If I marry the prince, I will be a princess, Isabel thought, and one day a queen, and no one will dare call me ugly ever again. She opened her eyes. Good girl, be brave, be quick, Mama said. Cut at the joint. Isabel pulled the blade from the flames and tried to forget the rest. Thank you.